All right. Um, so today uh, we'll we'll do a little bit of the book for the first time. Okay, because we have just gotten to the point where we can uh, maybe not do parallel programming, right? But we can talk about laziness in Haskell, and there are some very nice uh, demos in the book about um, laziness. But first, uh, let me finish up the, the thing that I started uh, previously, and that's the product types. Right? Remember product types, and some types, and void, and you need this form nice algebraic structure. Okay, so remember product types uh, in terms of sets, that's just Cartesian product of two sets, which means pairs of elements from, from two sets. And now we can unpack a product type or a pair in, in particular, which is the simplest product type, uh, by pattern match. Right? But there is also another way, if we don't want to unpack it at the left side of the function definition, uh, and then we can use uh, functions to extract um, the elements that, that sit in the pair, right? So there is this function first and the function second. And um, so, so there's this duality between pattern matching and, and unpacking using these projections, right? But in fact, the projections can be implemented easily in terms of pattern matching. So, so uh, let me show you um, like how to implement the function uh, first, FST. FST, right? So how do we implement it? Well, well it, it's a function that takes a pair, right? So let me, let me write uh, type signature. So it takes a pair of A, B, right? And extracts the A from it. And the first component is of type A. So we'll implement it by pattern matching this guy. So we write the pattern for it, which is, well, let's call it X, Y now, okay? Um, and this is equal, so what does it return? It simply returns x, the first component of that. Um, so this works, this is great. Um, but why do we need this y, right? Why y? We don't use it, right? It's here a, sort of like a placeholder. So every time you have a placeholder in, in your pattern, um, you can just replace it with a wild card. And the wild card is an underscore. So you just put an underscore here. Uh, it means, uh, you know, what, we know that there is something there, but we don't care. We are not using it, because we didn't give it a name. And as I said before, in Haskell, we are kind of skimpy with names. We don't, we don't want to use too many names because they pollute uh, the namespace. It's very environmentally friendly language. Okay, so second, of course, SMD. What kind of pattern would we put here? First underscore, right? Because we don't care about the first element of the part, of the pair. Uh, and here we can call it y, just because, and returns y. So these are the projections in terms of pattern matching. Now I also mentioned that uh, data constructors, the stuff that occurs on the right hand side of, of data definitions, that these data constructors are really functions, right? even though they start with capital letters. So if we, for instance, type in GHCI, uh, 
what is the type of data constructor parent comma parent. That's the data constructor of pair. Now, for pair, actually, just to confuse people uh, and for environmental reasons, we use the same name for type constructor and data constructor. So how does uh, GHCI know that we are talking here about the data constructor, not the type constructor? They have the same name. Well, that's because we are asking it for type, okay? So this must be a, a I, type constructor. You can ask for information about the type constructor by using the kinds. Uh, wait, wait, wait. <coughs> don't <coughs> jump. <It's> not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what this will say, right, that the type of the data constructor is. So it's a function that constructs a pair. What arguments does it need? It needs two arguments, right? For the left side and for the right side, first and second component of the pair. So the first uh, component of the pair should be of some type A, arbitrary type, so we'll just use a type variable A. Um, the second argument will, will be also arbitrary type B, possibly different from A. And the result will be a pair of A and B. Right? And this thing here, the, the paren, comma, paren is actually type constructor. <coughs> right? Are you already confused about these data constructor and type constructor? thingy, especially if they have the same name in this case. Not always, but in this case they do. If we can ask uh, GHCI what type is the data constructor, is there an analogous thing that we can ask GHCI about the type constructor? See, a type constructor is, is also like a function. This is a function, right? But the type constructor is a function, but it takes types as arguments rather than values, okay? So it's sort of like a function from type A to and type B to, to another type, which is the pair type. And, and uh, so, so this is like a second level where we, where we say, well, types themselves have types. And these types of types are called kinds. So in order to ask uh, GCI what about the type constructor, we have to ask it what kind is it, which is colon k. What's the kind of paren, comma, paren? And this now is type constructor. And JTI will tell us something interesting. Okay, we'll say, okay, so it is like a function, sort of like a function. Uh, it's a function that takes one type and another type and produces a type. And you already typed it in, okay? So, star, arrow, star, arrow, star. What is star? Star in the kind language, so we have yet another language built in. Okay. In the kind language, it means any Haskell type. So, so the, the syntax is very similar to this, except that we now don't specify the type. We are just saying all types, all Haskell types, all Haskell types gives us a Haskell type. Okay. So there is just like a, this whole bunch of stuff called Haskell types, right? And they are denoted by star. So what would be an example of a type constructor that... So, so here we have one that takes two stars and produces a star, right? Right. I can see how you could have a type constructor that took one star and produced a star. Exactly. Or three or whatever. Mm -hmm. Are there, is there ever anything more than just some number of stars? Mm -hmm. so yeah, right. So what you, can, what, what you can do is, is have a uh, 
uh, kind that's, that is like this. And that's an interesting kind because it says, okay, give me a type constructor. That's a type constructor. It takes a single type, produces a new type. Yeah. Right? So give me a type constructor and I'll give you a type. Got it. Okay. Uh, so this, this brings up something that I've been wondering, right, which is we, we have a, a function like, say, identity. Right, just perfectly straightforward and ordinary function takes a value in, produces, gives you a value back. Mm -hmm. If you have the identity function and you hand it a type, does it hand you that type back, or does it say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a function. I operate on values. I don't operate on types." Okay, so that's a that's a very good question, yeah. and and the answer is both yes and no. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is it currently still no in your GHCI, or is it already yes? Oh, I'm talking about type promotion. promotion. Oh, uh, yeah, we already have type promotion. The data types can become uh, type level. Okay, so 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 the th yeah, the thing is that if you have if you, if you define a data type uh, in Haskell, uh, you can promote this type to a kind. So it has you know name and then two parameters. I mean, you know if these two parameters can be values. Or these two parameters could be types. types, right? And you can apply it in two different contexts. Now, I don't know which version of, of GHC actually implements this kind of promotion or type promotion. Promoting types to kinds. Yeah, I mean, kinds of interest. Yes, this one does allow it. Yeah? I mean, you have to use a special switch. So we, we don't usually use kind signatures, but it's possible. Like Just like we have type signatures, we can have kind signatures. And in some very complex type calculations, we actually can explicitly use kind signatures to tell the compiler what we mean if it doesn't follow directly from the context. So now, Let's talk a little bit about um, laziness, right? So there are these two camps in languages. The huge, huge camp of uh, eager programmers and, and the tiny one <laughs> of lazy programmers, right? Um, so what's the difference between eager and lazy evaluation? In, in a language, right? Eager evaluation is you evaluate an expression immediately. You know, once once you get to an expression that says x equals one plus two, you know, okay, let's add this, and uh, and from now on x equals three, and that's it. If you are passing uh, an argument to a function, then this and this argument is an expression, right? Um, then also, in an eager language, this expression will be first evaluated, and, and uh, then the value of this of this expression will be passed to a function. It's not so in a lazy language, or actually, a better name for this would be strict and non-strict. Right? A lazy language is uh, more precisely non-strict, or actually Haskell is non-strict, right? Because it does not enforce laziness. It just says, I don't guarantee eagerness. Right? So in practice in Haskell, if you say, you know, square root of one plus three, um, you, you are calling square root with this expression one plus three, not with four. Okay. Now, if you then want to use the square root, the result of the square root somewhere else in your program, like you want to print it, okay, at this point it will say, okay, I have to evaluate the stuff, so I have to evaluate square root, but the square root of, of this expression, oh, I have to evaluate this, this expression, so I will evaluate 1 plus 3, get 4, then the square root of this, get 2, and, and I'm done. Okay. In practice, it's done, sort of the implementation level, 
it's done by creating these thunks, which means um, essentially parse trees of expressions. So you are passing around these parse trees at runtime, okay? And only when when you need the value, then you evaluate the parse tree. So just a an implement. So I, I wrote a lot of the code in C sharp that does that. So I'm I'm curious uh -huh. as, to, as to how it was was actually implemented. Do do you run a compiler over the parse tree and generate some kind of like bytecode or something and then execute it, or is there actually like a little interpreter in there that's uh, that's evaluating the Okay, the, parse tree as you the, the, the mechanism is that uh, for every, well, essentially everything is a function call, right? I mean, if you ask two numbers, that's a sure. call to a function plus with two arguments. So what, what happens is that for every function, um, you, you just uh, create a thunk. Mm -hmm. okay? And a thunk contains you know, a pointer to a function and then pointers to arguments. And if these arguments are unevaluated, then they will also be thunks. And what happens when you evaluate the stuff, the thunk changes. So internally, you know, instead of pointing to a function, it starts pointing to a value, because it's been evaluated already. So if you need the same, the same expression twice or three times or so, so on, it will only be evaluated once. There's a lot of sharing in, in Haskell. And, and this lot of sharing is possible because we have pure functions, right? So things never change. They are, they are all, all, always frozen. So we can put as many pointers as we want to, to, to a thunk, and it's fine. Once the thunk gets evaluated, you know, all these pointers will point to an evaluated thunk, and so on. So th these are just um, considerations. Um, of implementation. Uh, now, you can implement lazy evaluation and eager evaluation in every language. It's not just that you can do this in Haskell. Um, the, the difference is what is the default, right? In, uh, in other languages, the default is, is eager evaluation. Doesn't mean that you cannot implement lazy evaluation in let's say C++ or Java, you can. But you will have to be clever. You will have to say the argument is actually, you know, a thunk. Can I have to implement the thunk by hand? And it's possible. It's, it's, it's been done. And there is, uh, for instance, the, there is a whole book about uh, uh, persistent data structures by, by Okasaki. And, uh, and instead of writing this in Haskell, the poor guy wrote it in ML. And ML is by default eager, right? So he had to implement special extensions to, to actually uh, enable laziness in uh, ML. But he also wrote an appendix in which translated it to Haskell. It's a much simpler code. Um, so that and in functional programming there are these schools, two schools, ML school and uh, Haskell school that differ on what's, what's the default. And uh, F sharp, for instance, is based on ML, so it's here by default. But, but you said you implemented some lazy data structures? Uh, I did um, uh, lambdas and expression trees in, in C sharp. Mm -hmm. So the expression trees, when they need to be actually evaluated, we just we just emit code uh -huh. for them, right? Uh -huh. We just actually uh -huh. wrote a little compiler. Right. Yeah. Okay. But in Haskell, it's Dead. that's what happens by default. Got it. Yeah. Um, okay. So now my assistant uh, Michael Sloan will do a little bit of coding from the book to show you how uh, laziness actually can be shown in, in um, Haskell. Uh, what we can do is define x equals 1 plus 2, and right? now this is something that has not yet been evaluated. This is literally just a function that is evaluated. 
literally x is pointing to a thunk that is some computation yet to be executed. Um, really, it's just a value, but that value still does not yet have a concrete memory representation as the number three. Uh, so we can ask the GHC about that. Uh, we can ask it, is this thing currently evaluated? What's its status? And this, so uh, this is a special command, all yes. of sprint. It prints the value, but without evaluating. Right. And so then that's uh, this is something you don't end up using that much, usually, unless you are investigating things that have to do with uh, whether something's evaluated or not. Uh, investigating the laziness in your program. Um, so if I evaluate it by asking for its value, and it diligently runs off and computes the bugs, uh, then I can ask if we can. So they actually had to evaluate because he printed it. Okay, in GHCI, when you say variable, when you say the name of the variable, it prints its value. And for that, it needs to force the evaluation. So once he printed it, it, said it has been already evaluated. It's really uh, essentially syntax trigger for this. The GHCI asks the type of the expression, and based on that type, it does something cleverly. Uh, but we'll skip over that bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, ask for this thing. I can also move this to the What's that thing called? Show. There we go. It's more better. Um, so, yeah. Then, what isn't that supposed to now be something uh, other than underscore? You evaluated it, correct? So Remember the trick with int? Oh, yes! <laughs> Goodness, we covered this. Okay, let's let's ignore this issue. It turns out that you need to type... Uh, it's, it's actually due to a difference in GHC since the book was written. Is that polymorphic? Yes. X is too polymorphic, and so each time we ask for uh, concrete instantiation of it, it's a different one. It's a different one. It's actually a different object. No, it's actually in the book. Oh, really? Yeah. It's been around, been around for a while. Okay, cool. Oh, of course it's been around for a while, yeah, because it's... Right. Yeah. So if you say x equals 1 plus 2, well, the compiler doesn't know what type x is, right? Because it could be an integer, it could be a double, could be any of the types that form the class num, right? Which is called a polymorphic value. It's not something that you see in many languages, a polymorphic value. It means that it has um, different possible values depending on what type you assign to it, right? So if he evaluated this stuff and, and didn't put a type on it, it's still polymorphic. And evaluating it to, let's say, probably default was uh, an integer, right? Right. Yeah. So it evaluated the integer value of x, but there is also a double value of x, and there is, an, you know, some other values of x. How is it able to do the calculation without <coughs> knowing that, without fixing the type? Uh, well, no, it, it fixes the type when, when you call internally called print. It's actually just special defaulting in GFCI. Yeah. It says, oh, hey, I have a num type class okay, for this value that I want to evaluate. I'll default it to integer. Or the integral type class. But, but this would work in GHC as well. Yeah. If you say print 1 plus 2. No, it will be happy with you. Let's try it. Print 1 plus 2. It will give us an ambiguity error. Yeah. Really? Yes. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, I know. Um, it'll give us an ambiguity warning, actually, or a defaulting warning. That's really what it gives us. Oh, okay. Ah, but we have to force it. <laughs> F1. Oh. That's a lot of work. There we go. Yes. Warning. We're defaulting the following constraints to type it. Ah, oh, okay, okay. So you have to do some magic in order to force GHC to so, like, doesn't find admit a problem. Right? 
Otherwise, it just pretends, oh, everything's fine. But it takes a default for you. So it's not only JCI, but JNC as well. So when you compile, the same thing. All right, so let's go uh, to the next. So these are the thumbs, right? Yes. We can just like a description. X points to a thumb that has a pointer to a function plus. That's a function plus. And two arguments. And these arguments are also pointers <coughs> to uh, value, to actually values one and two, right? What is this vertical bar? I don't know. Uh, the vertical bar is separating the different like cells of the data type. So well, no, example, I mean this one here. This. Oh, uh, that I. is an I constructor. It's yeah. like yeah, it's it's a something that takes an unboxed int uh, and it turns out okay. the box. Okay. Int. Technically, it should have a hash after it, but I'll okay. ignore that. <laughs> So if we make a construct a more complicated expression, let's do it, do it live uh, by doing this, and then also defining something in terms of x. Uh, I'm not sure if I've emulated the book perfectly here, but you get the idea. I mean, you can actually create more complicated graphs of uh, dependencies among the computations. And so when we ask for one of these, say y, you can actually force this whole tree of evaluation. We ask for just x, we will share the work used to compute x when we later compute y. Yeah, the thing is that if you print y, you force y, then x will be forced too because y is using x. So next time you print x, it will say, oh, it's evaluated, right? Right, so we can actually ask those questions and neither of them are evaluated. Yeah. But if we evaluate uh, y, and ask about x, we find out, hey, it's been evaluated. X been evaluated. By a spooky action at a distance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a wormhole between y and x. What's cool about this is that spooky action is completely well principled. Uh, because we have a pure language, uh, we know that nothing bad is going to happen by sharing this computation. Modulo, some weird things like unsafe perform by O. So, uh, okay, let's know. <laughs> there are Please many. strike it from the record. <laughs> if Charles isn't here to bring that up, he always brings that up. <laughs> okay, so, what about C? Ah, right. So, uh, C is this magical function. Some people actually think it should have had a type class. Oh, I shouldn't go there. Anymore. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but anyway, what it does is it uh, takes two values as inputs. This is the A value and this B value. And uh, when when someone puts demand on the result of this, it will cause this A value to be evaluated. And now this is uh, what would be referred to as a shallow evaluation or weak head normal form if you want to be fancy. I call it shallow evaluation. That sounds good to me uh, because it really just evaluates the uh, topmost data constructor. It doesn't descend into its fields. That's, that is something else. Um, so if we bring back our, our x and y on uh, uh, oh, no, a warning. Okay, I'm going to restart GACI with yeah. that. Uh, Yeah. There we go. Okay, so we brought back our x and y. So now we have this deep tree, right? Y is a, is a deeper tree because it contains x, and x is unevaluated. Right, yes. And uh, so the other way of uh, evaluating this would be to uh, have this guy pass a tuple in. And when uh, GHCI demands that tuple in order to print it, I could make this even more explicit and say that I'm passing this thing to print, and the that effect of printing and demanding the tuple value is causing Y to get evaluated due to this uh, seek thing. And the reason for seek, seek should not actually affect 
the uh, so now this value re program. returns the second argument, which is uh, yeah. 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 Uh, which which corresponds to the type. And, right. uh, so it could really the only effect. Might, could you go back one sentence? The, the reason for C. Oh yeah. There, so the reason for C is actually not a, a semantic difference for your program. It's a performance difference. It's when are things going to be evaluated? Because uh, it actually takes memory to store a computation that's in flight. We actually literally need a tree representation. This is a tree of flows. And so we can get memory leaks if we build up giant computations. And that can cost a lot of performance, cache coherence and stuff. And so if we have seek, we can demand that something is computed at a particular time. And this allows us to crunch potentially these large computation trees down into more compact representations. So the use of seek actually allows us to do eager computations in Haskell. The default is lazy calculation, right. yeah. but we can always force it to make a, an eager calculation. Yeah. Just like in other languages, we can make uh, lazy calculations. Right. And there, there's actually a uh, yeah, question. <laughs> Last week, you guys said that uh, any time you complete something, um, you, you, you can always find out exactly how it was before. Does that mean, I thought that implied that, that tree structure would be maintained and not right. But, but notice that Sprint is is just a debugging tool, really. Mm -hmm. It's part of the built-in debugger. Okay. So it shows you things that you're not supposed to see. Okay. We are so, peeking so under the covers. I, I, I interpreted the question differently. I think yeah. last week you talked about constructors, and you said that um, you can tell how something was constructed. And I think this is different. Uh, yeah, okay. No, no. But it's, it's very similar because uh, when you construct something, what, what, what are you doing? You're calling a function, the, the data constructor, passing it some argument. So it's just exactly like a function call. It is not evaluated immediately. It passes as a thumb. But the moment it's not you ever, need it's it, not, actually. It's not ever evaluated. A constructor uh, and the data that was used. To uh, it it is actually constructed. evaluated if you force it. Well, there is an example uh, with with a pair, right? So that that's that's something to, to come next. Because pair is constructed. A quick question about let x equals one plus two. Uh, is it safe to say that in a program that you compile, as opposed to executing the REPL, that will be optimized to a three? They cover the constant folding in the compiler. Yeah, I believe so, yeah. If you presumably really compile with the optimization level above, you know, like 0.3 or something. Yeah, 0.0 yeah. might not do it. But right. Yeah. Right. So, a pair? Yeah, so a pair. Uh, so, we're going to let. Uh, what else are we going to do? Well, we're going to ask about it. Uh, but x is already evaluated. So yeah. Let me find something else. Bam. Okay, so this tells us that uh, our pair it does not have either of its fields evaluated yet. And it looks like this. Oh, this is the next example. Right. Well, it's, it's part of this uh, larger example. Well, let's do it in So the bigger example now is the yeah, import tuple. Yeah. And now, in, in this library tuple, um, there is a function called swap that I previously implemented as flop. So that it wouldn't conflict with the library, but it wouldn't. So, so, yeah. So swap swaps the uh, the two elements of the pair. So note, note the difference here, which is that with Z we've actually already got the tuple, and with swap we have nothing evaluated. We really don't even know if it yields a tuple properly. Right, because Z now is is a thumb. Uh, Right. It's a thumb. It says call the function swap with these arguments, 
right? So it hasn't been evaluated. So the question is, well, what happens if I evaluate X? Uh, well, we, we could expect that uh, one of the fields of this thing will be now exist. Oh, oh, but we've got to evaluate. We've got to seek Z. And I think, consider that, uh, as I said, it only does a shallow evaluation. It only evaluates the top. And so we aren't actually going to get a fully evaluated tuple because it doesn't descend into the fields. So he now forced the evaluation of Z. And he right. forced the evaluation of X. of X. But these are shallow evaluations, right? Yes. So now we, we still don't have the first field which corresponds to the x plus 1 right here. After we swap x plus 1 goes into first place, right? Yeah. But it hasn't been evaluated yet. Nobody demanded it. So it still remains at the thumb. That's why the underscore. So whatever doesn't have to be evaluated, it still remains a thumb. Swap does not need to evaluate its argument. Swap just produces a, a, another pair with pointers to the arguments. And these arguments don't have to be evaluated. Why does seek take a second argument when it could just return unit all the time? Ah, because we need to know when to perform the evaluation. And so we are waiting for demand on seek's second argument to trigger demand on the first argument. Because otherwise, when are we going to do the evaluation? You see, seek itself is not that eager. Right. So seek, seek itself does not cause the evaluation. Sure. It just says, okay, I, um, I would make sure that the first thing is evaluated, shallow evaluation, right? Uh, when you demand the second argument. Couldn't now, now this, this is getting us very close to parallelism, right? Because in, in parallelism, we'll see that actually seek will, might cause the first... There's a way to say, evaluate the first element, even though I'm not even really asking for the second one, just keep evaluating in the background. Just start a thread, start evaluating this thing. Right? So this is very important for parallelism. This is why this is the first thing discussed in this book. Now, when is the evaluation done? Because when you are doing threads, right, it's important that if you tell the thread to evaluate the stuff, that it actually evaluates, it doesn't return you a thumb to, to the first thread, right? Because then you evaluate it in the wrong thread, which is okay, the result will be the same, but you haven't gained any parallelism because so you got back a thumb. So we have to force stuff to evaluate in another thread and return the value from it, rather than a thumb. Why does supplying the second argument force the evaluation? It's the definition of C. Ah. So it's, it isn't really supplying the second argument, it's more the demand on the results of seek itself. So for example, here I've said to let w equal uh, c first to c uh, tuple uh, argument. Uh, and so, uh, if we evaluate this W, it will cause demand on this uh, unit. Right? And uh, that thing will get filled in. Does that make sense? 